as many of you already know, as you've already heard, our daughter just returned with a team of 31 other students from Costa Rica. They were there on a short-term missions trip. Um, we picked her up at the airport on Friday night, stayed up into the wee hours of the morning, very, very late. Um, as she shared with us different events and aspects of the trip, as she shared with us the things that she had experienced, the things she had felt, the people she had encountered. And what blessed me, what impressed me, what blessed me, what stood out to me and, and, and meant so very much was that she consistently shared and discussed not so much the beauty of the country, although it certainly was a beautiful country, um, not so much the hotel or the food or the buses or the things that they did, the plane rides, the brief time they got to go shopping, all those things. The thing that she consistently wanted to talk about over and over and over again was the people, the Ticos, the Ticas, the, the young men and young women, the, 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 the people that she connected with there, the relationships that she shared. And certainly the relationships that went with her, she had relationships and the students and the team that went but they were new formed and new found relationships there. Um, literally, as she has shared, there were cultural barriers, there was language barriers, there was economic social barriers of all kind, but there was a common thing that united, and that was love. And not just a common love, not just an earthly love, but a love that is wrapped around Jesus Christ. And, and, and through that relationship, in, in a matter of hours, a matter of days, they literally fell in love with one another. There was just such a bond and such a connection to the people and the culture and the country. Um, it, it, it really is about the relationships. Now, we've got a picture this morning um, of this is her team as they travel. This is actually in Costa Rica. This is the base of a mountain volcano. And obviously the relationships of the people that went they were good before they went. We know that they grew stronger on the trip. But it was these newfound relationships in a very short period of time, even with differences, cultural and language differences, where they were able to connect in love at another level. So that's what we want to talk about today. L-O-V-E, love. Now, I know some of you are quickly going to say, well, Pastor Red, that seems to be what you want to talk about every Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of a simple guy. Um, Jesus, when Jesus was asked what's the most important thing, what's at the core of everything, he said love. And so I guess you could say I'm a foundational preacher because I'm still preaching in the foundation of love. Everything that we do in the kingdom, everything that we do in this ministry, everything that we do in our lives should be rooted and grounded in love. Not, not, not Hallmark Channel romantic kind of love, but Jesus Christ gospel kind of love. Amen? That, that there's a, a unifying principle in the love of Jesus Christ. It is, what, it is a love that spans cultural differences. It is a love that spans language differences. It is a love that spans denominational differences. It is a, a, a language and a love that, that just crosses all of those boundaries. Um, today we want to talk about that love, and we want to talk about that unique love that is wrapped around the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because it really is all about Him. I, I am quite certain that when we get to the kingdom of heaven, when we get to the kingdom of heaven, if Jesus only asks us one question, amen, everybody's looking forward to going to heaven. Yes? I'm not amen. the only one that's excited about this prospect. If we get to the kingdom of heaven, if there's only one question that Jesus asks us, I'm sure it won't be, how was your obedience? Now, obedience is important. It's good. But I don't think that'll be the first question he asks us. And if he only asks us one question, I don't think it'll be, how was your obedience? I don't think it will be, how was your sacrifice? I certainly don't think it will be, how was your righteousness? Or, how was your religion? Or, perhaps, how was your holiness? Yes, these things are all important and they're all good, but, but if Jesus only had one question when we appeared before him, I don't think it would be, how was your religion? It wouldn't be, how was your holiness? And, and I know this may rub, rub a little bit the wrong way, but, but I think if Jesus only has one question when he meets us, it won't even be, how deep was your worship? It won't be how long were your prayers. Amen? It won't be how accurate was your Greek or your Hebrew pronunciation. How thick was your concordance. Amen? He won't, if he only has one question when we greet him, it won't be how many degrees did you have. It won't be were you ordained or were you just anointed. 
I, I believe that the one question that Jesus would ask us, if he, if he only asked us one question when we greet him, I believe the one question he would ask us, how did you love? How did you love? With the life that I gave you, with the love that I gave you, with the relationships that I gave you, with the situations that you were in, how did you love? Did you love the way that I did? It's a very powerful question. Imagine standing face to face with Jesus. Literally his breath and the light of his words just sweeping over you. And he says, how my son, how my daughter, did you love? Did you love the way that I did? Did you love with the love that I love with? Very powerful question. You can hear the quietness in the room. You can hear the stillness in the room right now. Because everybody's thinking, wow, that may be a tough question. That may not be the question I was prepared with. I was prepared to tell him about all my tithes and my offerings. I, I was prepared to tell him about all the time that I spent in prayer. I, I was prepared for this, that, and the other. But that love thing. <clears throat> Perhaps he'll ask us, was your love lavish? Was it overflowing? Was your love without dissipation? Was it without restriction or hindrance? Was it without fear? Did you love without fear? Or did you step fearfully into situations thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to love, but only, you know, from a safe distance. Mm -hmm. Only in environments where I know I can control or have some idea of what is coming. Or did you just wildly, lavishly, Isn't that what he did for us? While we yet certainly didn't deserve it, while we were yet sinners, lost, bound, hindered, enemies even of God, he stretched forth his arms upon a cross and said, I love you this much. As far as the east is from the west, some have said. It is the love of God. Romans chapter 12 says it to us this way in the New King James let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, I know that dissimulation is a word that most of us use every day in our conversation. <laughs> you probably said it to the person at the cafeteria just the other day when you were having lunch. Dissimulation simply means to be without hypocrisy. And even more succinctly, it means to be sincere. Let our love be sincere. Let it be genuine. I like the way the New Living Translation says it. The New Living Translation says this. Don't just pretend to love each other. Oh, come on. How good is that? How good is that? Don't just pretend to love each other. Does that not speak to the core of our society? Does that not speak to the core of the church at large today? Don't pretend to love one another. Don't, don't get a t-shirt that says, I love you, and then hate, hate the person behind their back. Amen? <laughs> don't put a bumper sticker on the back of your car that says, I love Jesus, and then drive like you're on your way to hell. Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> don't pretend to love others. Really love them. What a call from the Scripture. What a call from the Holy Spirit of God. Don't pretend to love. Really love. You know, if you didn't know better, it's almost like he was reading our mail. Amen? It's almost like, eh, I, I'm going to go ahead and hit you right, right to... Don't pretend to love one another. Hey, it's nice to, 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 to put on the shield, but, but don't pretend. Really do it. Really love one another. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy. But work hard. And serve the Lord enthusiastically. Oh, I can't believe i got to get up and go to church again. i got to be there before service starts so I can greet some folks. Erg. That's not enthusiastic service. Amen? It's not. 
Let us genuinely love one another. Genuinely loving one another doesn't mean that we say, well, you know what, it's Sunday. I know I'm supposed to go to church on Sunday and during meet and greet. I know I'm supposed to hug some people and smile at some people. You know what, for about three minutes, I think I can muster a fake smile and some pretend love. <laughs> Let us not pretend. Let it be genuine and real. Let it come from the depths of who we are. Amen? We say around here that the Garden of Grace is a growing place. It's a place that our love should grow. It's a place that that love should grow within us because we can't give away what we don't have. Amen. You ever tried to give away something you don't have? Amen. Somebody walk up to you and ask you for money, and you're like, I'd love to, but I got no money on me. It's hard to give away what we don't have. Right. Somebody comes up to you and they need love, and you're like, well, my love tank is empty. <laughs> I can't give you what I don't have. So. Let us grow in our love, in the love of Christ, because it, all love comes from God, and it fills us up. It is His love that we share with one another. We don't, in and of ourselves, have the capacity to love. I know that's shocking. That you, some of you may not believe that, but the reality of the matter is, we didn't even have the capacity to love a holy and a perfect God until He first loved us. When He drew near unto us, His love began to invade our lives, and in that place, we found a love that began to heal us and even allow us to return that love unto Him. And as we began to return that love unto Him, He began to invest and to pour more of that love into us, and now we had overflow to share with one another. And that is the purpose of His kingdom. The Scripture is replete with references. Over and over and over, the Scripture tells us, talks to us about loving one another and how to share that love and how to care for one another. And in fact, the Scripture goes so far to say, that if we say that we love God, but we don't have love for one another, the truth's not within us. That we can't love God without loving one another. It is a basic commandment. But we know it, we've shared it, we've preached it over and over. But it's the beginning of the year. And we're speaking of foundation in this ministry. There's some wonderful new people who have come to be a part of the family. We're... we're, we're, we're recommitting ourselves to foundational truths. We're making sure that our feet are firmly established on the rock that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, He is love. And we want to be well positioned and well anchored as we move into this year of transition. This is a year of transition. It's a year of transition for the church. It's a year of transition for the world. It's a year of transition for us as individuals. Let us be firmly rooted and grounded in the things of God. And his love for everything that we will face as we move forward in this year. <clears throat> There's a prayer that's been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. We don't really have any idea if it actually was his prayer or had anything to do with it. But it's been attributed to him. It's called <laughs> the Prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Pastor Debbie and I actually have a framed copy of it that hangs in our house and has for years and years. It's a, it's a beautiful prayer. A prayer that I even fell in love with as, as a child. In fact, it was one of the things that I prayed is I was earnestly seeking to be someone other than who I was. Not liking the way that I treated others, not liking the way that I spoke to others, not liking the way that I interacted with others. This was a go-to prayer for me as a young man. And it holds as much merit in our lives today, certainly in mine as it did then. It hangs on the wall of our house and it reads as such, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, harmony. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. The prayer continues to go on and say, O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood is to understand, to love, to be loved is to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. It's this particular part right in the middle of this sandwich. It's a love sandwich, amen? amen. We got love, and we got love, and in the middle we got a hunk of love, and it's just kind of all sandwiched together. But this, this middle meat part, this part about us not so much seeking to be consoled as it is to console. Not so much seeking to be comforted as it is to comfort others. 
Not so much seeking to be understood as to understand. You know, so very often we want to be heard. We want someone to hear what we have to say. We're so eager to speak to others. May we be ever more eager to listen. Amen. Most often the most meaningful moments to someone are the moments not that we speak into their lives, but the moments that we hear them. Mm -hmm. That they know that they are valued. Mm -hmm. That they know that, that, that what is going on in their life, as bizarre as it may be at times, or as meaningless as it is to the relevance of our life, because they are important to us, that circumstance is important. How powerful a prayer to pray every day that we would not so much seek for others to understand us as we would to understand others. And then to be loved, but to love. All of us, no doubt, want to be loved. Many of us are spending most of our time running around trying to find someone to love us, someone to validate us, someone to affirm us, someone to make us feel better. What if we invested all of our time in loving others? I can assure you scripturally, as well as by experience, that when we invest our lives in others, when we reach out to love others, God pours that love into us. We do indeed reap what we sow. We, we share that love. We reap that love. May we indeed be a people, both in this ministry and in the body of Christ at large, who seek more to understand than to be understood, to love more than to be loved. It is the culture of this church to love one another. It is the culture of this particular family, this particular body, to love one another. It's, just, it, it's the culture that we desire. It's the culture that God has called us to create. It's the culture that we were created to be a part of, literally to be a big family. Now, this doesn't mean the big family like you grew up in where dad always screams, and, and mom's a little bit psycho, and, and your older brother's a mess and in and out of jail, and there's some dysfunction throughout the family. Amen? We're not trying to replicate that big dysfunctional family. We're trying to replicate a functional Christ-like family, a family that is filled with the power and the presence of God. You know, there have been people who have come to this ministry, and they've been here for a while, a couple of years or something, or a few weeks or a few months, and then they had to move. And you know what? They're still a part of the family. Amen. We still love them. We still communicate with them. We still stay in touch with them. They miss us. We miss them. They're a part of our lives. We're a part of their lives, even though they live in a completely different state. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've got other people that have come here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And they are, they are not a part of they, They've never been a part of the family. It, it's about an extension. It's about giving of ourselves. We are about loving one another and being a family, which means that we make investments in one another. We share love. There's a connection. There's a unique love. It's a love that's wrapped around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is literally at the center of it all. What made those relationships that, that our daughter experienced on that missions trip possible was the love of Jesus Christ. There was cultural differences. There was age differences. There was language differences. There was economical, social differences. All kinds of differences. And despite all the differences, there was one common thing that allowed them to be unified and to fall in love with one another. And that is the one common thing that we are looking for in this house, in this family. Because all of us have cultural differences and language differences and belief differences and all kinds of things that could divide us if we would allow it. But, but hopefully, we share that common bond of the love of Jesus Christ. That love that flows through us. And in that, just as Ashley and her team were able to fall in love with the Ticos and Ticas, and just as the Ticas and Ticos were able to fall in love with Ashley and the team, we should be able to fall in love with one another. Amen. 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 That is a good place to shout. You know, so very often that's not maybe necessarily the thought that we have when we come to church. Oh, I know some of the singles, they come to church every Sunday hoping to fall in love with somebody. But that's a romantic kind of love. That's a whole different thing. Amen? We're talking about coming to church every Sunday desiring to fall in love with the people that we're gathered with. Even the ones who are kind of annoying. Even the ones who look funny and smell funny and talk funny and... and, and 
think funny and amen because let's face it you're the only normal person you know everybody else is a weirdo <laughs> come on let's just be straight I know because I'm one of you I know how we think really the only one that's got it together everybody else is kind of a weirdo but I'm gonna let the love of Christ bridge that gap span that gap I'm gonna I'm gonna find the, the, the common thing that we share we must not allow our differences to hinder us from falling in love with one another if we are going to accomplish all that there is for us to do in the kingdom of Christ. It is sharing a godly love, a reverent love, a respectful love. This is not an abusive love. It's not a, a usury love. It's not a, it's, it's, it's not a romantic love. It is a godly kind of love. It is a reverence and a depth. It is a bond that unifies You know, there's basically three kinds of people that you meet in church. You meet people who have shoes. Amen? Amen. That's a good thing. Then you meet people who have shoes, and if they have the resources, they'll buy you a pair of shoes if you don't have a pair. Amen. But then there's a third kind. And these are the people who will give you their shoes, even if they can't afford another pair for themselves. Amen? Amen? Brother Copeland and Sister Enid have been here for a little while now. And I'm just so excited that they're going to be a part of this family, a great part of this family. Amen. See, I believe they're the type of people that, that would feed you dinner, even if they didn't have dinner for themselves. It's that kind of love that just, just fits in the family. Amen. And I don't call them out to exclude anybody else. I just have had a chance to get to know them a little bit recently. And there are many people, as I said, who have come to this ministry and they just didn't fit and they, and they left. And it was probably because, well, they probably loved their shoes a little bit too much. <laughs> Amen? But there's a lot of you who have come here and found that, you know what? You love the people more than your shoes. Amen. And so, yeah, they may step on your shoes sometimes. You may want to give your shoes away at some point. But the relationships, the love that we share. You know, I do want to make it very clear today that, that, that we're not saying that God hates for you to have stuff. And we're not saying that if you come here, you've got to give everything away. It's not really the act of giving that matters so much. But it's the fact that it's an expression of what's in the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. And I would say to you that out of the abundance of the heart, the body acts. Amen. We may confess one thing with our mouth, but it's what we do with our body that speaks. It's not the act or even the expression, but it's the love behind it. You don't have to give it away. But the willingness, the want to. The part of you that says, this human being, is more valuable than any of my stuff. This other person, their well-being is even more important than what I have. It's out of that heart that we create family. We don't give to get acceptance or approval. You know, we sometimes read the scripture and there's all these promises about we give and we get. And some try that like it's a magic formula. Like if I just give in, then I'll get to take out. Whatever I put in, then I get to take out twice as much. Like a magic vending machine at the wherever. But it, it's out of the heart. When we see others give, and maybe what they give is barely adequate, but it's, it's so given with love that a harvest, abundance, just rains down and flows through it. It is that expression, that overflow of love that is in our heart. It says, I see my brother, my sister in need. I see something that I can do, whether it be listening, whether it be giving, whether it be sharing, assisting, comforting, edifying, whatever it is. Because I value them, I will do this, I will do that. You know, I would say to you today that, that the 
proper gospel is not always the popular gospel. <coughs> Amen? We know that, indeed, the prosperity gospel is a popular gospel. Mm -hmm. I stood here and told you every day, every moment of every day, that, hey, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be rich. You're going to have everything you want, everything you desire. Blah, 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 blah. That would make us feel good, but it's not really going to edify us. It's not going to edify the body of Christ. Because we've got to reconcile it with that part where God said, you will indeed have troubles, mm -hmm. trials, temptations, difficult circumstances in this life. Don't worry, you'll overcome. I'm with you. I'm greater than anything you're going to face in this life. But you're still going to face some stuff. So that popular gospel is not always the proper gospel. But the proper gospel says, though it may make me poor, I will endeavor to see you rich. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if every person walked into a church meeting on Sunday morning and said, it may make me poor, but I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to be used of God to enrich in your life, even if it costs me something. Or in the case of Christ, even if it costs me everything. He did say that we're to love one another as he has loved us, and he did indeed give everything. He became poor, that we may become rich. Amen? That's not just financial. Let's move beyond the financial, the stuff. Let's move into the spirit. He became lowly that we may be exalted in Christ. He gave his life in exchange for ours. The popular gospel says that you come to church for what you can get out of the church. The proper gospel says that you come for church so what you can put into the church. Are we seeking the popular gospel of what we can take out of the church? Or are we seeking the proper gospel of what we can put into the church? Yeah. It's a good place to shout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't shout me now while I'm preaching good. <laughs> but it's a good place to shout. Mm -hmm. This is our church culture. That we are to love one another. A love that is sincere. A love that is without dissimulation. It is the core basis of the vision. And it is to be the core <laughs> basis of everything that we do in this ministry. How can we be the most loving people possible? How can in any given situation, any given circumstance, with any given person, how can we love? This morning we announced that one of our brothers needed a ride to the doctor on Tuesday morning and immediately a hand went up. I'll take him. That's love. Amen. It is love to get up in the morning and drive somebody to the doctor. Because mm -hmm. It's not fun to get up in the morning, much less drive somebody else to the doctor. Nobody wants to go to the doctor themselves, much less take anybody else. <laughs> and then you've got to go back, you've got to pick the person up, and they've had a little medication, and they're kind of loopy, and they want to talk about all this goofy stuff that doesn't make sense. And you drive the car, and you're thinking, boy, I'm glad I love them, because otherwise I might push them right out the car. I don't want to hear any more of this. They're goofy. And about that time, you remember, you know, I'm kind of goofy myself. I'm glad people put up with me. Amen. So... Let everything that we do be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. That unique, sincere, genuine love. You know, I would say to you this, that all of those things we mentioned earlier, they're important. Worship is important. Pastor Debbie said this morning, he said, worship reveals the heart of God. And I agree, it absolutely does, because God's heart is love. God is love. We should be worshiping not because the tune is catchy, but worship is an expression. It is worship. It is adoration. <coughs> we, we should not be worshiping because somebody said, it's worship time, so let's get our worship on. We should be so desperately in love with Jesus Christ that we are running to the church to lavish our adoration upon him. And to share that love with him. All that we do. Prayer is a great thing. Yeah. Holiness is a great thing. But it should be driven out of our, our love. Our adoration for our Savior. And our love for our brothers and sisters. Our giving. Should be out of the generosity. The overflow of that love. 
Giving should be an expression of love, not because we're hoping to get twice as much out as we put in, but because we love, we just want to give. Now, we know that it will be given unto us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, because we gave out of love, Amen. not out of compulsion or guilt or fear. The scripture says that fervent prayer avails much. That's passionate prayer. What makes us more passionate than love? Well, let's see, my brother's sick, and I know I'm supposed to intercede for my brother, so at least let me put aside three minutes, because I'd want him to pray for me if I was sick. Or do we say, oh my, my precious brother whom I love is dealing with something that God did not create to be in his body. I am going in intercession, I am hitting my knees, and I am going to pray that thing out of his life, because it's not what God wants, and because he's hurting, and I love him, and I don't want that in my brother's life. That is fervent, passionate prayer. That is prayer that turns the heart of God, yeah. and he moves the heavens and the earth. He violates the natural laws of this broken earth, and pours out his life in response to love, mm -hmm. not because the words were not because we prayed long enough, or not because we had the right soaking music in the background, but because the love just poured out in intercession and prayer. We are continuing our series growing forward in 2015 in discussing the vision statement for this ministry, which I said last week we would continue this week. And we did continue it. There it is, the vision statement. Didn't want to end today without showing it to you. Everything in the vision statement begins and is rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. We are growing forward in 2015. And why we grow, it's about love. This is the first paragraph of the mission statement. I told you last week, do we look at it this week? We're looking at it. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now that next week we're going to dig into it, I think. Amen. I planned on digging into it this week. But we're out of time. So I guess next week, if we're all here together... The Lord tarries. He had not come and taken us all out of here. We'll dig into this. Because it talks about loving God, loving ourselves, and loving one another. It's the first paragraph of the vision statement because everything that we do is to be rooted and grounded in love. Copious, overflowing, obnoxious, lavish amounts of love. We worship. We love. We share. We give. We edify, we comfort, we strengthen, we bless, we listen. Because we love. And in that loving, we will be loved. We will be abundantly blessed. Jesus Christ is sitting around. He is just desperate to bless our socks off. Amen? Amen. He is just desperate to pour out and lavish His love and His peace and His grace upon us. His love. Let us so position ourselves that he can do that very thing. Let us not be the hindrance to the Lord. I'm going to encourage you this week to read the 12th chapter of Romans. The scriptures that we've taken this morning are taken directly out of the 12th chapter of Romans. The precepts, the concepts that we've discussed are discussed throughout the whole chapter. It talks about the body of Christ. It talks about being a living sacrifice. It talks about loving one another. So please, over the course of the next week, read and study the 12th chapter of Romans. Pray about it. Meditate about it. Let God speak to your heart.